Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. But I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all as all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. For a man indeed ought not to cover his head. For as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman, neither the woman without the man in the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so is the man also by the woman, but all things are of God. Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. Now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. When ye come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. For in eating, every one taketh before other his own supper. One is hungry, and another is drunken. What? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread, and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death until he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread, and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is a famous verse, a famous, famous passage showing the Lord's Supper. Um, not so much dealing with it in particular as in the ordinance itself, but I find in reading this, it's, it's taking what it should have been and trying to clarify it for a group of people, the Corinthians, who we know were a carnal group, a carnal bunch. 
as Paul outlines this, you see that he seems to, in the middle, kind of jump into a different context, talking about hair lengths and that sort of thing on a man versus a woman and the difference there. And it seems almost um, out of place because he, he, he says, I'm praising you for the ordinances, talks about the, the hair length, and then he's back into the Lord's Supper. But everything in its context, we'll walk through this and we'll see what Paul was trying to say in dealing with the Corinthian church in regard to the Lord's Supper here. I understand that many of us have different backgrounds, especially the Catholics. They would have done this this, uh, this Lord's Supper or this Mass uh, weekly, um, maybe twice a week, even at length sometimes, right? Um, Baptists have been known to do it a little bit differently, and, and everyone does it, in reality, a little bit differently. Um, in, in studying this out, I found it difficult to just nail down, as God often does with us, the steps to or the how to deal with a certain scenario, especially with regard to church. And it's interesting because even the Apostle Paul here in dealing with the Corinthian church, he didn't give them everything that they needed. And that's plainly shown in the very last sentence of that chapter. And the rest will I set in order when I come. But we don't have record of Paul when he came setting this thing in order. Okay, So, therefore, I believe this is something where Paul wanted to give guidelines to a church, but then ultimately it was left in the authority of the church. Else we would see perhaps... 2 Corinthians dealing with this in particular and giving us step-by-steps and ways and hows too, right? But we don't see that. So let's go through this chapter in its context because this is the one that quite often people use to be the guideline of the whole thing. But myself, I think the best guideline for the whole thing is when the actual event took place back in the Gospels as it was written and as it was performed by the Lord Jesus. So look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Verse 1, as Paul is writing here to the Corinthians, he says this, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, brethren, that ye remember me in all things, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. But I would have you every know, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. What's Paul establishing here? Well, he says, first of all, follow me. As the leader, Paul's saying, hey, follow me. Follow my writings. Follow what I am showing you, what I'm, you know, what I'm demonstrating to you, what I'm writing unto you, as I also am of Christ. He says, follow me as I follow Christ. In other words, Paul is setting himself up as a standard, an example to follow in as much as he is following the Lord Jesus. Then what he does is he says, follow me. He also says, remember me in all things. In other words, bring the things that I'm recording and, and sending your way into remembrance. Remember them in particular. And he says this, and keep the ordinances as I delivered them unto you. Keep them specifically as I delivered them unto you. Okay. But then there's this word, this little word that you always grab in scriptures. And I like to circle it every time I see it. Verse three begins with, but, okay. Follow me, remember me, keep the ordinances as I delivered them. But, right, I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ. What is he saying here? Follow me, keep the ordinances as I delivered them. But I would have you know who your head is, who's in charge, who's the boss. Jesus is, Christ is. Okay, so what is he explaining here? He's saying, hey... I'm an authority over you in this fashion, but Christ is your head. And that's going to be the, the, the crux of the whole matter of what the Apostle Paul's talking about here. Follow me as I follow Christ. Remember, Christ is your head. Okay? So if you were to read down, and we won't for sake of time, all through verse 4 through 16. This is where Paul changes from saying, hey, the head of man is Christ, to now talking about the head of people's hair. Okay? This may seem strange. This may seem unusual. What is happening here? Okay, He is setting up rules, and even my Bible says this in the top, rules or, or, or things to follow or guidelines with regard to divine duties, divine worship, divine service. So what is he saying? He says, when you are praying, look at verse 4. Every man praying or prophesying. So, so praying, bowing the knee and calling out to God, or prophesying, which is the proclamation and proclaiming of God's word. He's saying any man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. 
Okay? There is a covering that is dishonoring. And what is that in the context as we read? It's long hair. It's a shame for a man here in the context to have long hair praying or prophesying. And I would say that that extends to everything that goes on. If we're one way when we're praying and prophesying, to not be hypocrites, we've got to be the same way all the time, correct? So what he's saying here is that it's a shame, clearly in verse 6. He said, having your head covered dishonoreth your head, men. Okay, in verse 6 it says, it's a shame then for the women to do the opposite. It's a shame then for the man to have that, that state. Long hair on a man is a shame, it's dishonoring Christ as the head. Short hair on the lady is a shame, it's dishonoring Christ as the head. And now there is, there is a, a difference given about where the woman could take a covering if it would be a shame to be shorn or shaven if she was in a scenario where she could not perhaps grow her hair long and wear it as, as long as somebody else, right? But the, the, the exception always proves the rule in these cases, right? He's giving us an outline of things that are dishonoring, that are shameful in regard to following Paul as he follows Christ, remembering and keeping the ordinances. Okay? We're keeping ordinances. These are some things that are shameful and dishonoring in the same context here. And it comes to this question there in verse 13. Judge in yourselves. Okay, So examine yourselves. Look to yourselves. Judge in yourselves. And look at this question. Is it comely? Okay. Now we can leave the rest that's being talked about here. But that's the main question. Is it comely? Is it agreeable? Is it suitable? Is it pleasant to look at? Is that, is that normal? Is it, is, it, is it comely? Okay. Verse 14 right after it says, Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto you. So he's asking, judging yourselves, what you're seeing here in the example I'm giving you, in the context of, walk, of following ordinances, is it comely? He says, doth not even nature itself. He says, is it coming? Is it natural? Is what you're seeing natural? Does it have a place? Does it look appropriate? It's a question that he's asking. Is it comely? And we need to look at that in the whole context of what we're dealing with. Be a follower of me as I am Christ. Remember me. Keep the ordinances as I deliver them. And he said way back in the end of verse 34, the rest I will set in order when I come. You see how there's a little bit of, there's wiggle room here. There's, there's, Paul hasn't closed the gap on this thing, but he's ultimately bringing the highest authority as Christ. Now, is it comely? Look at verse 17. It says, Now in this I declare unto you, now in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together not for the better, but for the worse. Now, is that comely? Is it comely to come together for the worse? Right? You would think, uh, I mean, we don't want to be hypocrites, but you'd think when you come together into a religious setting, it would be for the better. There would be an improvement on, on the things that you would normally do in the world. Right? We don't want to engage, encourage people to be hypocrites, but there is a reason why I put on a suit and tie when I come to, to church. Right? There's a reason why I have a different standard when I come to church, because I intend to come together for the better. Is it comely then, as he's talking about in the context, to come together for the worse? Look at verse 18. Is it comely? For first of all, when ye come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. Is it comely? Is it appropriate? Is it natural? Does it fit to have divisions in a group that is supposed to be following Paul as he's following Christ as the head? Is that comely? Does that make sense? Is it, is it appropriate that a group that is all united to follow Christ has divisions? I would say no. Verse 19, For there must, also, there must be also heresies among you, that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So heresies, is that comely? Is it appropriate? Is it natural? Following head is the Christ. Him being the sole, um, the sole uh, purveyor, the sole, you know, dispenser of doctrine, and giving you appropriate words of life to live by. Is it, is it comely that this group, when it comes together, has divisions in the church? Is it comely that they have heresies in the church? Is it, is it comely that they come together for the worse? No, it's not, right? This is what he's talking about here. Verse 20, you'll read, When ye come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And this statement is being made it is, uh, it is sometimes, I think, taken as when you come together, this is not. 
to eat the Lord's Supper. In other words, coming together, you do not eat the Lord's Supper. But what he's dealing with is saying, when ye therefore come together, this is not the Lord's Supper. The statement is being made. What you are doing is not the Lord's Supper. You are all coming together into one place. You're supposed to be following Christ. And what do I see? Uncomeliness. I see divisions. I see heresies. I see you coming together for the worst. You're in a worse state when you come together. This is not to eat the Lord's Supper. Right? What he's setting up, I believe, is, is a difference that's taking place. Today we have things set up a little bit different. We did a little bit of a no different order today. And this is, I believe, the main thrust of what's being talked about. Normal church service, right, which for the Corinthians was coming together for the worst, and the Lord's Supper are different, right? When you come together into one place, the same routine where you meet together, and for the Corinthians, this would have been perhaps daily. I, I, anyways, probably a greater increase in, in uh, frequency than what we're doing today. They probably met two, three, four times a week. Who knows? Maybe their meeting place was just always moving with people coming and going. I don't know. But he's saying, hey, when you come together in one place, this is not particularly the timing. This is not to eat the Lord's Supper. What you're doing is not the Lord's Supper. It seems like this was kind of just an iteration of what they're doing. It almost seems like they were doing it a little bit Catholic style. If, if, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken. It seems like they were just coming together. Some would come, as the Bible says. We can read um, on into uh, verse 21. No, oh, sorry. Verse 20 says, When you come together, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. This is not an every time thing. And if you were to look over to verse 26, it says, As oft as ye drink this cup. In other words, there is an oftenness that is is not the same as the when you come together, okay, in the context of things. So when you come together, and then there's as oft as ye do this, as oft as ye drink this. They're different things. So is it comely? Verse 21, it says, For in eating everyone taketh before other his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunken. Okay? There is no unity going on here. In other words, there's divisions. There is drunkenness here. In other words, there's heresies. There's people that are, are believing in, 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 in part that it's, it's all right for them to show up drunken. So this is where I say it, it become this sort of routine where every single day, whenever they came together, they were simply partaking of what they thought was the, the Lord's Supper. When you therefore come together into one place, this is not the Lord's Supper, what's going on here. Verse 22, a strong rebuke comes. He says, what? Have ye not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise ye the church of God and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. Y you guys have come together for the worse. In other words, what you have, you got houses to eat and to drink in. Why, why aren't you uh, hanging up your track pants there? Why aren't you snacking there? Why aren't you having your meals there? Why aren't you doing, doing all those things there and then coming together into one place in the church and having it for the better. Why aren't you esteeming this for the better when you come here, right? And his attack on them is like, you're calling this coming together every time the Lord's Supper, but you, you, can't even, you can't even give it a higher standard just on a normal day. Let alone what's being dealt with here, particularly in the context, being the Lord's Supper. A higher standard, a different standard being dealt with here. So, in verse 23, he talks about what was delivered unto them, okay? Because it's clear he's saying there's, that, that I delivered something to you guys, and you're doing it differently. If you read down in verse 23, For I received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, okay? So I don't know if the Apostle Paul actually in his, in his visions had an experience with God where he showed him. Or if what he's talking about here, receiving of the Lord, is just reading the Bible as I did. Matthew, Mark, Luke, the revelations of, of the men as they were penning up the scriptures. But he said, I received of the Lord that which I delivered unto you. And what did he deliver? That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, he took the cup. When he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as oft as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. And it's pretty plain what he's delivered unto them, isn't it? It's just, it's just straightforward. You could almost read that right out of Matthew, right out of 
Mark, right out of Luke, just, just plain. This is what I delivered unto you. Jesus took the bread. He broke it, said, Take ye, this is my body. He took the cup when he had supped, and he said, This is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance. If you look in verse 26, you see, For as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. So the manner of which this is done is one of in immense simplicity, okay? I just see that. You, you look at it, and it's just plain. It's just very simple. Takes the bread, breaks it, makes a statement, takes the, takes the, the, the juice, parts it out. They drink it, makes a statement, okay? It's very plain. It's very, it's very, the manner is that of simplicity. And wouldn't it be so that, that the simplicity of Christ would transcend into this time of fellowship that we're to do with him? as oft as we do. The purpose is clear, and that's what it says in verse 26. It says, For as oft as ye drink this, or as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do shew the Lord's death till he come. So the manner is simple. The purpose is remembrance of Jesus. Showing the Lord's death till he come. That is the main purpose. That is the main article being dealt with here. We're to show his death, remember his death till he come. Now, all that in the context of what's going on here. Is it comely? Is it comely what was happening? That was what he was asking. Is this whole thing comely? Is what you are doing comely? And so that's where I think that this is not attacking the manner in which a body of believers decides to pursue and to, and to uh, remember the Lord. I don't think that's what the Corinthian church is, is being. They're being like a type of church that covers every scenario. Right? You've got to do it this way. No, he's dealing with ones in particular that have a very uh, worldly influence on them. And he is saying to them, is it comely what you are doing? Is, is this right? Is this natural? Is this, is this normal? Is this, is this make sense? Right? I delivered you a very simple performance of the Lord's Supper. I delivered something very simple. And what do you have? You have people coming together for the worst. You have people with heresies and divisions coming together. One's eating, one's drunk, and all sorts of chaos is going on. What in the world? He says, but there's a simplicity here. This is what I'm talking about. Verse 27. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat that bread and drink that cup. Okay. So this verse in particular is used so often to just make the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper, into this, this woe is me, analyzing myself, self-reflection, sad moment. And, and you know what? Remembering the Lord's death is a somber thing, okay? But what I have seen, I, I, I took part in a church many years ago where, where it, was, it was probably five or six, as long as I had been there, years before the pastor had ever done the Lord's Supper. Now, there is no rule, right? It says, as oft as you do, and kind of leaves it open. That's fine. That's his choice. But he looked at this where it says, if somebody takes the bread and the drink unworthily, he shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. He says, let a man examine himself. And then it says in verse 30, for this cause many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. In other words, they would say, I would heard it, I'd heard it said, if you're not doing this worthily, and you're going to be sick and you're going to die, okay? And this was this was the thing. And so his his major major problem, his major uh, um, issue with having it at any kind of regular frequency was he was like, oh, I know, brother, so and so's in this sin, or brother, so and so's in that sin, and I'm just worried about like killing my whole congregation by doing the Lord's Supper, okay? Because it was a bizarre belief, but that 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 was what he had told me. Like he 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 was worried that people wouldn't get it right before they took it. Therefore, they would take it unworthily, and they would get sick or they would die, according to verse thirty, where it says, "It's made sickly among." Okay, but again, we got to remember in the context what's going on here. Paul delivers a very simple presentation of the Lord's Supper. And what does he say? He says, do ye this as oft as ye drink it. So whenever this happens, do it what? In remembrance of me. Verse 26, for as oft as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye show the Lord's death till he come. Okay? That's the main focus. That's the primary goal here. A simple remembrance of Christ till he comes. Not a 
confusing, difficult recollection of all the sins I've possibly ever done so that I have to for, ask forgiveness for them before I take this thing so that God doesn't strike me dead, okay? That's like, that's like the repent of your sins version of, 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 uh, of the Lord's Supper, isn't it? It's like, it's, it's, it's not right. It, it's wrong. Okay, that's that's what I believe. That's that's not what the main point is. And I'll give you that this this chapter is a little bit confusing, especially when you throw the long hair thing in there. But it's just it's just showing that there is something that is natural, something that is comely, something that is proper in order following the Apostle Paul teaching, which he gave was simply how the Lord did it on his last supper. Okay. Now, the problem here is not that the person is unworthy, because are any of us really worthy at any particular moment of receiving something, anything of the Lord? No. No. We're all, we're all unworthy of anything but the grace of God to save our very souls and to sustain us and to, to keep us. If the if Lord should mark iniquities, who would stand? Okay. So what is unworthily being talked about here? Well, praise the Lord, the Bible tells us. Yes, verse 28, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. There is an examination taking place here. Verse 29, for he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. And here is the Bible giving us in plain text the definition of what, what unworthily means. Not discerning the Lord's body. To do it unworthily means to not put worth to it. There is, it is, it is the opposite of having worth for the Lord's body here. You're doing it without worth, without honor, without decency, without making it something special and unique and, and precious to you. You're doing it unworthily. You're not discerning the Lord's body. You're not perceiving it correctly. You're not recognizing what you're actually doing here. And so often I have done it myself until I came to the point where I had to try to figure out how the church at Sound Words Baptist in Toronto was going to do it. I did the same thing where I sat there and I'm like, okay, Lord, how many sins have I done this week and what should I do? Because that's, that's the common teaching. But not discerning the Lord's body is what it means to be unworthily. That means I'm not putting the proper worth to it. What's the proper worth to it? Having the right focus. What's the focus? Simplicity and showing the Lord's death till he comes. That's the plainness of the scriptures here. The simplest unworthiness would be me not. It's funny because it's made me do it unworthily by looking at all my sins and self-examination, focusing on myself through this whole thing. When putting the proper worth to the Lord's table, the Lord's Supper, would be me remembering the Lord's death till he comes. Properly remembering him looking to him, thinking about him, meditating upon him, and everything he's done. Not trying to do an inventory of all my sins so I can be as squeaky clean as possible before I stand before him in fellowship. That's never going to happen. None of us will stand before God squeaky clean apart from the blood of Christ being upon us until we're raised again new. So, we will stand before him as unclean things in the flesh with a regenerated new man within us, forever until the Lord's come. So what do we look at? We look at his death. We remember his death. We remember what he did for us when he went on that cross. We remember what he did for us when he gave his body. We remember what he did for us when he shed his precious blood. And what did he do? He did that so we didn't have to sit here and think about all those sins all the time. And yet we take the Lord's Supper and we make it this thing where that's all we want to do is think about our sins. It's wrong. It's unworthily performing the Lord's Supper. That is not comely. Judging yourselves, the Bible says. Is it comely? Is that appropriate when you're thinking about God's death to just meditate upon every single one of your sins and try to get clean before coming to him? No, no, no. Even when we're saved, we go to him as a dirty sinner and say, God, cleanse me. Okay? How did he do that? Through his shed blood, giving his body, sending into hell for three days and nights, rising again from the dead. That's how he did it. That's what his death did for us. So that we have sins now that are as far as the east is from the west. Now, if your sins are that far separated from God, who are you to go and try to count them? Count your many sins, name them one by one. Come on, it's not going to happen, right? It doesn't make sense. It's not comely in the Lord's table. Verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 
But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. There's a clear statement about how God works in our lives. We, we judge ourselves, we do things appropriately, and when we don't, we are chastened of the Lord, that he can bring us back into his sheepfold, bring us back into the proper order of things. Now, we would not be condemned with the world. Verse uh, 31 talks about, specifically what he's referring to, I believe, is the judgment of our own hearts. And if we were dealing with the context of the Lord's Supper, it would be regarding how we are discerning the Lord's body in this fashion. Verse 33, Wherefore, my brethren, when ye come together to eat, tarry one for another. And there is the principle that I grabbed a hold of today for allowing for others to come. I encouraged everybody to be here on time, and things happen, right? When everybody came together, we waited, we tarried for them. This was, this was one of the few little instructions that the Apostle Paul gave to us. Praise the Lord. Verse 34, And if any man hunger, let him eat at home that ye come not together unto condemnation, and the rest will I set in order when I come. And then there's another principle whereby, I didn't bring the snacks in today. I asked the, the gracious ladies that bring them all the time to just, to just abstain today, okay? So we, 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 we eat at home, we come together, we meet as a church, and, and, and this is how we're going to perform the, the comely Lord's Supper. We're going to do it in the order that the Apostle Paul gave. We are to follow the Apostle Paul as he was following Christ. And how did he follow Christ? He looked to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, saw what was performed, and did it according to the manner given there. And then he follows it up with, he leads it at the end, the rest will I set in order till I come. And so, since it never came, Brother Josh is going to follow Christ, and you're free to follow me as I'm following Christ, in the same order that's given here. We've been given liberty. We're not going to use it as an occasion to the flesh, right? We're not, going to, we're not going to make a party out of this thing, which I think the Corinthians did. But we're going to use our liberty to choose the finer details of what's going on here. But the, but the Lord's Supper as a whole is, is very simple. It's very, um, it's very precise. It's very, uh, there, there's not, not a whole lot of, of, uh, of, of, of means to confuse the thing, in my opinion. And so, we can deal with this a little bit once, once we get going, but I just wanted to present that because, again, 1 Corinthians is often given as a, as a means to order the whole service, but I, I just don't think there's enough there to do that. So what I see is, is a few examples given of comeliness versus uncomeliness, of, of proper order and decency versus the flesh, what was going on here. And I see the worthiness being dictated by what we're doing in the Lord's Supper as a whole, okay? And so um, I'm going to just, just break there, and uh, we'll just pray to God, okay? Thank you, Father, for this.